thanks for staying up later. And what a rare honor has now befallen Jerry Seinfeld. He's got the hat trick, his third appearance. Three times on the in the later big program. chair. And I'll tell you, it's feeling better and better. You're sort of easing into it now, aren't you? Yeah, this chair, the cushion's starting to soften up. <laughs> it's good. It, it suits you. Yeah. You look right there. I feel good. My arm feels good. Think about it now. This will, all things considered, in fact, what do you have to consider besides adding it up? This will be 90 minutes on the later show. Have you got 90 minutes worth of material? We'll find out, won't we? Are you a sitcom guy now, do you think? When you're walking yes. down the street, do people say, sitcom guy or stand-up guy on The Letterman Show, The Tonight Show? I don't know. I, I, I don't know where people know me from. You know, because I do stand-up on the show, so uh, they, uh, they kind of react to me as a comedian. Which is what, what I wanted, you know, I didn't want, I, I didn't want to become a sitcom guy. You had you know? been in a sitcom before, not the yeah. star, but you had a role in Benson, right? Right. And uh, it was really difficult to be saying things that were not my own things, you know. It's, it's really hard after years and years, and I've never had a writer all the years I've been doing stand-up. So I've been doing my own ideas all this time, and then all of a sudden somebody says, here, do this joke. Is every word you speak on the show written by you? No, a lot of it's written by Larry David. I would say most of the material on the show is written by Larry David, but we do it together. So it's like, I say, well, I, let me try this phrase or do it this way. But Larry David is the, uh, is the real brains behind this operation. He, he is responsible for most of the tone of the show and the characters and a lot of the situations. And we write the dialogue together. You say it half-kiddingly, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. You really don't have any interest in being an actor or in appearing in something other than a vehicle like this where you're playing yourself completely. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was thinking of being Jerry Sandler on the show, you know, one of those nice TV type of names. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. See, comedians spend their whole lives trying to be themselves, you know, and trying to get everything out of the act that's not the essence of you. That's what a good act is. You get a sense of the person. But actors are doing just the opposite. They want to be somebody else. How's it changed from last year when there were a half dozen or so episodes to this year when it's a fixture? I think it's better. I think we've just, the, the writing has improved, the, uh, the acting has improved, uh, except for mine. And uh, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a lot t tighter. We're like, we're comfortable now. We know what we're doing. I mean, Larry and I, who, who were writing this thing, we've never written a TV show before, you know, so we didn't really know how to do a sitcom. So yeah. it took us, took us a while to learn it. Imagine you really being passionately angry. It's hard to imagine <laughs> no. a real malice yeah. in you. No, I don't get angry. I don't get angry. I, I hate traffic. I really hate the traffic more than anything else. And there was another thing I was thinking about um, when you're backing up, the face you have to make when you're backing up. For some reason, as soon as you put the car in reverse, <laughs> you got to make this face. I don't understand that. Is that because you know you're going to hit someone and you want to get your face ready? Well, I'm about to hit something. <laughs> I can't see so good. You, you know what you got to do? You got to sling that right arm over the back of the oh, thing. Like, that gives you some leverage. Yeah. You know? Now I can drive. <laughs> you know? Like this, I couldn't do anything. Now I can see where I'm going. <laughs> and in case you have to make an adjustment, maybe you could jerk the car back a little bit this way. Yeah. If you just kind of crooked your elbow. Sure, yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Are you at a point now where you can actually compose a nearly perfect Seinfeld joke on stage where your own rhythms and, and the peculiarities of your own delivery are so ingrained in you that you can compose a joke that you couldn't possibly write any better if you yeah. went back to the hotel room that night and worked on it. You, you do learn your voice after a while and, and how you would say something. Um, and it's, it is funny sometimes. There's a, there's a thing happening on stage you could sit and work on a joke for hours and not get it. And you stand up on stage and it just spills out. There's a magic to the stage. Sometimes you see people on stage and go, oh, those are, they're so quick, they're so funny. And you don't realize that there's something, I don't know what it is about being in front of people on stage. Maybe it's fear that motivates you, but your brain can work at an unbelievable rate. You know, an idea that I couldn't resolve. I'll get on stage and the punchline will just come right out of my mouth. You know, just have a setup for a joke. You know, uh, something like, uh, you know, what, what, why do, why do we wear cologne? Who are we kidding? You know, do people think I really smell like this? 
Are they going to always expect me to smell like this? Who am I fooling? <laughs> and I could never figure out what am I going to do with that, you know? And I got up on stage one night, and I, it just all came tumbling out. And that, that happens a lot to me. You ever think of funny things and say to yourself, that is funny, but it won't work for me? Yeah. That's Jay Leno funny. Right. Or somebody else funny, but it's not Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. I, I have jokes in my act that sound like other people talking. and There are comedians, we give each other jokes, you know, sometimes. Someone will fix a joke for you or give you a line. Like, uh, actually, that line about um, when you're backing up and, and you're looking over your shoulder, and you think, maybe I'll get off and get back on going the other way. You know, that's the only thing you could think when you're backing up. Jake Johansson gave me that line. And uh, every time you do a line from, that somebody gave you, you see their face for a second. You know, in your mind. Whenever you're on stage, no matter how many times you do the joke, it's just like a little blip of their face. Are you at a point now where it's hard for you to test material? Because especially among people who frequent comedy clubs, you're so well known and so popular that there's going to be a reaction when you go on stage that's more just giddiness, like, hey, Jerry's here. Same thing if, if Leno were to go there or, I, you know, whoever, Paul Not Poundstone or whomever. So it's not a good gauge of what a paying audience would react to or is just funny, funny, and it's all up the same. For the first 10 minutes, you might get a laugh on who you are. But after that, you have to earn it, at least with me, because I, I've never been, you know, like a comedian that people get really excited about. They come and see it because they know it's going to be funny. And, but it's not like Robin Williams or somebody where people just go mad. They go nuts, you know. Nobody, nobody gets that excited, so I, I have to earn it, you know, which I like. You know that there's at least a sliver of the audience, I guess, and critics for sure, who say, here's a guy, he's got a good delivery, he's got tremendous presence, good turn of phrase, but this is, in the end, about nothing. <laughs> right. You know, there's no soul to this. Yeah. Nope, there isn't. There's no soul. It's just this uh, bionic creature on steroids. <laughs> how, how much has that gotten under your skin? All of us oh, at one time or another get, get nailed, for good reason or for bad. Has it bothered you when that happens? No, not at all. I mean, I, I believe in comedy as, as uh, having its own reason for existing. It doesn't have to be anything to me but funny. I mean, Abbott and Costello made a huge difference in my life. It didn't change the structure of the society, but that doesn't mean it was worthless. I mean, comedy should be like a dessert. I mean, shouldn't it be kind of a light, loose, fun thing? I understand. I guess maybe I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here because it may bother me more than it bothers you. If I go to see Richard Pryor or George Carlin, especially in the 70s, and then I go to see you, I'm laughing at all three. I understand the distinctions between what each of you is driving at, and I don't expect you to do what Richard Pryor did or what George Carlin did. I don't expect them to do what Lenny Bruce did. I want to laugh. Right. And if I get something additional from it, if I get some larger observation, like Richard Pryor was transcendent mm -hmm. in that respect, okay, we're talking about a bonus. But the main thing is, is the guy funny? Well, what, I mean, what would you consider a transcendent observation by Richard Pryor? That, well, uh... Pryor, Pryor brought those characters that previously didn't have that much of a voice in mainstream America. Uh -huh. He brought them to life. Right. He not only made you laugh, he, he recreated street scenes. He, he had these characters who had unbelievable humanity within them. Uh -huh. uh, there, was, there was a drama and comedy happening simultaneously there that I think very few people have ever approached. Right, right. But I wouldn't call that a force for social change. I would just call it extremely artistic, you know? So I don't know what... People often say there's no message, there's no, you know, meaning behind it. I don't, I don't think there's meaning behind most of it. It's just, it's just all how well it recreates moments of life. Do you wonder what people are thinking about you, especially now where you're either completely recognizable, someone says, hey, there's Jerry Seinfeld, or at the very least they're giving it, uh -huh. where do I know you from? And sometimes they almost stalk you. Well, a lot of times I go up to people and I say, didn't I, when I see them looking, I say, didn't we go to school together? I try and throw them off and see if they can figure it out, you know. Didn't we have a job together somewhere? Didn't you work at the same desk that I had? If you bump into somebody like that, do you sense sometimes that they try to be funny? They feel obligated, hey, here's a guy who makes me laugh. He doesn't know me from Adam, that. but I better be funny. I know, I don't understand that. Why do people want to be funny? 
I mean, I don't try and be funny, and I really don't. It's just when, it, when I'm on stage, you know, I'm funny. But if I think of something funny, I say something funny. But people, when they meet a comedian, they want, they want you to go, you know something? You have really got it. <laughs> you you should, are one funny yeah, guy. You shouldn't be driving this bus. You should be a comedian. You've really got something special. Or else they want to give you some horrible joke. I don't know why com people want to give comedians, but joke jokes, you know? 18 naked lizards or crawling. You know, it's just <laughs> some horrible thing. And they said, you can use that. People who claim Use it if you want. <laughs> like, if I use it, the guy's going to stop me. He's going to catch me, you know? Like, he's got an act. <laughs> people who claim to be fans of yours and yet so misunderstand what you do that they think you'd be telling a story like that Myron Cohen would tell. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like I'm in my act, I'm going to go, you know, a druggist said something funny to me the other day. <laughs> <laughs> do people call out for favorites now? Yeah. Now, I have to plead guilty to this, if guilty is the word. The first time I met you, I happened to be walking down the hall, and you were on the Letterman show, and we bumped into each other oh, in yeah. the hall. And immediately I referred to your joke about Robert Hughes, the world's fattest man. The world's man. fattest man. Do people do that with you? Yeah, they do. It's a pretty strange thing, you know. It's like, because usually, you know, it happens to musicians. They call out a song and you play it, but request jokes is a strange <laughs> kind of experience. I always thought the whole point of a joke is you don't know the end of it, you know. I don't know why people <laughs> want to hear a joke over and over. Well, you could tell it. Why don't you tell it, you know. <laughs> you know it. I know it. We all know it now. <laughs> What's the point of telling this thing? It's like, you know, pull the rabbit out of the hat, you know? All right, the rabbit was in the hat. We know it's in the hat. Who wants to watch a magician from the back? <laughs> and yet, I saw you at uh, Washington University in St. Louis about a year ago, and that very thing was happening. Yeah. Pe people were, were yelling out for, what about when you find only <laughs> one sock in the dryer? Yeah. I go, yeah, go ahead. What happens <laughs> then? Why don't you finish it? But, uh, yes, it's very funny. Uh, people, I can't, I uh, know, people like to hear the same joke over, and I guess they can, you can't sing along with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> joke. You don't, you know, you tap your feet and you hear a song. Oh, this is a great song. I love this song. Let's hear this again, you know. And the joke, you go, what can you do w along with it? Nothing. You know, you just wait for the end. Yep, that was it. Yeah, I heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I've seen him do that before. He did it again. What's this story that, uh, our producers have told me about the first two times you were here, and, and I never got around to it, so now I will, about you appearing in a disco sometime in the 70s. Yes, I did, a, I did a, one of my first jobs. It was like, it was New Year's Eve, and I remember the name of the place. It was called Remorse, and it was, it should have been Remorse. It should have been <laughs> the name of it. I went out there, and it was one of these places, and I think a lot of comedians have this story where they, they have no, I, they're totally unprepared for you being there. And they had a mic cord, it was literally about that long. So it was like, I, I couldn't, the audience was over there and I couldn't quite get my head <laughs> even around. It was like, should I face them or have them hear me? You know, which is, <laughs> I had to make that very difficult choice. And they literally, it was like a quarter to midnight and I was supposed to go on, I was like on in a 10 minute break that the band was taking they literally did not know that I was on. They must have thought I was the sound man or something, or something. <laughs> and the, the din of people screaming and dancing and yelling didn't even subside enough for me to even say, have you ever noticed, you know, anything? <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, I remember going over to the guy uh, to get paid afterwards. I wish I was embellishing this story. This was a horrible experience to remember. And the guy said, oh, I didn't know you were on. <laughs> That's how bad it was. They didn't even know that I was on. And he was in the same room. You know, even fully mic'd, well lit, and with a complete attention, I don't think a disco crowd around 1977 would be your best audience no. because a sense of irony, almost <laughs> by definition, is lost on these people. No, because they're living irony. Yeah. They're living it. They are the joke, are yeah, they not? Yeah, that's right. And with that pithy observation, <laughs> we're back <laughs> after this. You're like me, which is frightening. Right. You watch The Love Connection. I love The Love Connection. Love Connection is the dating game 
time compressed with the newlywed game, all put together in one game. And there's only one man that can handle it, and that's Chuck Woolery. He's my hero. He's the only guy <laughs> who will not react. He does not react. He would be so great on a witness stand, no matter what you say to this guy, no matter what you did on that date, he doesn't go, you're sick, you should be tied up somewhere. <laughs> he, just, he just is there, you know, he's always got, he's got that huge shiny watch, you know. Big Rolex for Chuck. Big Rolex and the, and the socks and the, <laughs> and he's always, oh. That's the biggest reaction I've seen from Chuck Willery. So what you were you were stabbing the stuffed animal? Is that what happened? <laughs> yes. And uh, well, let's see who the audience picked for you. <laughs> you know. Don't you get the impression too that people in the audience are purposely picking the person they think is least well suited to the hapless contestant? Yeah. They really want to stick him or her with an awful experience and then hear the details later. Yeah. It's and the people never look the same. They're like. They have blonde curly hair in the video. What, how long has it been? They always look these much dates? worse in the video Horrible than, than the they video. do when they actually come on the show. The things that people will admit that they're looking for in a mate on that show in front of the nation. Yeah. To stand there and go, you know, I like a man with, you know, green shirts. They'll just say that, you know, that I like this, you know, I don't like a big butt. And uh, she had kind of a nice butt, and I like that. I like that a lot. You know, it's just like, whoa, you know, keep it to yourself. <laughs> these, these people have no sense of, do they realize that they're in public? Do they know that they're in public? Here's the single greatest. Is the moment. audience watching through a one-way mirror or something? Do they tell them this is all confidential? <laughs> single greatest moment I ever saw on The Love Connection. And it has plenty of competition because, after all, the show's a classic. But woman comes on. Woman was the one who did the selecting. Guy reappears in the screen. They recount their date. Yeah, we went to Malibu, and we had a little dinner, and we did a little dancing, and we walked along the beach. And then we went back to my mom and dad's house. Okay, and they, they each corroborate this story. And she says, my mom and dad had left a note. They were gone for the night. So Chuck says, being the keen interviewer that he is, so what did you do? She says, we sat down on the couch. We started a smooch. One thing led to another. He nods eagerly in assent, and boom, we made love, okay? The audience erupts. They're going crazy. Chuck is doing his takes. You know, he puts his hand on the side of his face that way, and he does that little squint thing. Finally, the din subsides. He goes, well, I guess this is pretty much a moot point. Want to go out with him again? She says, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> so basically, she admits that she popped the guy, but that's it. Let's see who the audience picked for her. Oh boy. <laughs> they, they picked the L.A. Rams. <laughs> Seinfeld, 9.30, Wednesdays on NBC. A giant, colossal, smash, tremendous hit. Soon I'll be looking through a square going, be there. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, kind of a... That's where I'm headed. Kind of a captivating thought. <laughs> yeah. You know where we're heading? Out of here. See you later.